Hi guys, so we are back at it again. We are now doing the paper four, one, two, and three. So I try to record as much as possible today because I still have to rush to work later on. So you notice the set is different uh, because I forget to bring my mic to office. So I'll be using this uh, Lavia mic here and the sound quality might not be as good. So I do apologize for that and I hope you find this video uh, beneficial. So without further ado, let's get started with the video. So now the paper that we're going to do is paper 41. So let's look through the question and see whether uh, is it challenging after the new syllabus change. Okay, so we have a transformation question here in question one. All right, so in part A, they wanted us to have a translation by the vector of eight and negative six. Things you need to take note is that the eight over there represent the changes in x, while the negative six represent the changes in y. So you have to go to the right hand side by eight times and then go downwards by six. So in our case, let's look at shape A. So if I were to shift this thing six steps to the right, okay, eight steps to the right, sorry. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, going down by six times. Okay, so this will where it roughly located at okay so this will be our a number one moving on we have our question two here which asks us to draw a reflection of shape a when the line is y equals to negative one so in order to make you be able to see it clearly at y negative one i actually drew a yellow line over here so your task now is to identify from your a how far apart was it from the reflection line so apparently it was three steps only so you have to shift it downwards by three steps as well then the shape would look something like this over here with one of the point labeled here the other one will be here and the last one is three steps below it so let's take out the ruler again okay so this is your A number two moving on we have another question that goes by describe a fully single transformation for shape a onto shape b so for shape a to shape b okay one is big one is small apparently it is a enlargement okay with a uh, skill factor but i'm not sure how much is skill factor yet so there's two things that you need to identify for this will be the first one where's the point uh, center of enlargement and then what's the skill factor so in order for you to find it i will be joining the corners together and check the overlap here okay once i'm done placing the ruler Okay, and draw a line, joining everything up. Moving on, there's another point here. And then the last one will be here. So with this information, you now know that it is a enlargement with a The coordinates that they overlap at is negative 5, 5 with a skill factor of then you have to count 
this is only three and after it was being enlarged how much the length has been extended so one two three one two three one two three so there's total of three three lines so the skill factor is three because three times three you will get it to nine so that's how you trace the skill factor then we have one last question here that is asking us for the single transformation a to c okay so let's try to get it sorted out here a to c huh? so for this it is pretty obvious it is a rotation however you might have to ask where is the center of rotation located at so this is what i do normally i will prepare two rulers okay and then i try to check at which point it will form a 90 degree so basically what we have now is the ruler being placed over here okay from what i estimate yep this should be correct so the ruler after being placed here i will join it to this point then imagine you're having two rulers now the other one i will be placing it over here So, the correct indication is when you were to place the ruler right over here, okay, you will form a right angle. Okay, imagine you're having two rulers now. One was being placed like this, and the other one was being placed like this. Then this part here will form a 90 degree. Okay, so that's how I usually do it, but uh, some students might not be able to get it. Uh, a few core concepts is required. First, you need to know it is a rotation. Okay, then you have to roughly estimate where could the point of rotation located at. Then you proceed with placing the true rulers. Okay, make sure you put them like this one and the other one over here or this corner this part here will indicate where is the center of rotation so for this question D here I will write it this way it's a rotation okay of 90 degree clockwise from the point of rotation the coordinates there is 1 1 so this is what they're looking for for your part D's answer Okay, so hold on here for a while, then we'll proceed to the next question. Okay, question two. A plane has a 14 first class seat, 70 premium seats and 168 economy seats. So the keyword here is simplest form. If you were to divide everything by seven, you will get 2, 10, followed by 24. But this is still not the simplest form yet. You still have to divide by another 2, which get you to 1, 5, and 12. So this 1, 5, and 12 should be your part 2a answer.
As for part B, they told us that the cost of the flight are in the ratio of the following. Cost of the premium flight is 114 and the ratio, remember, it was indicated as 6. So by taking the 114 divided by 6, then you get the value of one ratio over there, which is 19. So when they ask for us to find the first class flight, you just have to take 19 times 14. And for economy, all you need to do is to take 19 times 5. Which is 266 and 95 respectively. Okay, so this is your part B, section 1's answer. For an afternoon flight, the cost of a premium ticket was then reduced to 114 to 96.9. So find the percentage reduction. So for this, I'm taking Ori minus new divided by Ori and times 100%. Original here, in our case, it is 114 minus 96.9 over 140 times 100. So after you key in your calculator, you will get it as 15%. So for section C, okay, uh, when the local time is 8 and it's 9, the local time in Berlin is 8. So they wanted us to find the time difference. However, when the plane arrived at Berlin, Okay, they gave us a local time of Berlin, which is 15.05. So first, I'll be adding one hour to this and get to 16.05. So that I know when I compare and find the time taken, it's more accurate when the time zone is the same. So I'll be taking 16.05 minus 13.15. So students always ask why... Uh, can't I just gain the calculator because an hour is only 60 minutes. So you can't actually uh, use your calculator to calculate it directly. So this 6, if I were to borrow 1 to the pack, instead of writing 15, it would be 65 instead. Because 1 hour has 60 minutes. 65 minus 15, you get 50. 15. Minus 13, you will get 2. So this will be 2 hours and 50 minutes. Moving on to part 2. They gave us the total distance. And they are looking for the average speed. So when, you, when they ask for average speed, all you need to do is to take the total distance of what we have here is 1802 and then divide by the total time taken which is the 2 hours 15 minutes. However, there's one more step that you need to do is to change the 2 hours 15 minutes into 2 50 over 60. Okay, this is a mixed number and what does the 50 over 60 do is that you convert the 50 minutes into hours form. Okay, which gives you your final average speed as 636. This is for your C, part number 2. Okay, section 3. So finally, something from the new syllabus. This is a box and visco diagram and I hope that you have learned the basic. Okay, the center line here is the median. Okay, I just take one of them to show you the example. Then this is your upper quarter, lower quarter. This too is to indicate your range. So by looking at the graph, let's move on to check the statement, what they're asking for. On the statement one, average women spend less time exercising than men so let's look at the graph here by looking at the first glance i would totally disagree with this 
because first thing first the upper and lower quarter okay is actually higher for women and also median is also higher than men so i would disagree on the first statement that they stated over there reason being the median of women is higher than men so now this is what i would write you can write other points that you identified like what i mentioned earlier about the upper quarter and lower quarter the next statement over there is the times for women show less variation than the time for the men mm, let's see so from the graph over there the interquartile range of women is actually bigger okay uh, it's up to you whether you want to show the calculation or not i will just do it over here so the difference between the gap is 60 each of the boxes represent six so for women the interquartile range is calculated by using ten minus 60 which is 150 whereby for men it is 156 48 so 156 minus 48 it is 108 only so obviously women's in the quarter range is bigger so I would disagree on this as well. Okay, reason being. Okay, so these two will be my final answer for part A. Moving on to part B, calculate the mean. Mm, for this, there's few things that you need to take note. You need a midpoint for this calculation to be possible. So how do you get the midpoint? It's actually by taking 60 plus 0 divided by 2. So this you will get 30, 80, 130, 190, 270 and then divide this entire thing by the student's number so they gave us it was 100 you will get it as 87.4 as your mean time for this particular question moving on we have part 2 here where they gave us a cumulative frequency diagram and they wanted the 60th percentile so since the student's amount is uh, 100 just now okay so I just take from 60 then okay I will be using another color so that you can see it clearer okay so when it was being drawn down here it will arrive there So this will be 
90. Let's look at part two, what they are looking for. Okay, the numbers of children who spend more than three hours exercising. So let's trace back to the graph. So first thing you need to identify was that the time were given in minutes and the question was referring to three hours. So three times 60, you will get 180. So from 180, you will have to draw it out. Okay. And then check what amount it will locate it. Okay, so it is somewhere around here. Which is at 92. However, this is not what they wanted. Okay, because they wanted more than that. So all you need to do is take 100 minus 92, then you get the results as 8 as your final answer. Alright, so let's move on. The histogram drawn was a frequency table and the height of it. So when you saw height means they are referring to frequency density. So this, they have a formula of taking the frequency divided by the class interval. So you have to always make this as a practice. Check what was given to us. The frequency that were given to us will be this that I shaded in red. Okay, and then Referring to the question, the class interval was 100 minus 60. But for the frequency of this group, let's trace it from the previous page. They gave us as about 24. So 24 divided by 40, it is only 0.6. So when you notice there's a discrepancy between 0.6 and the 10.8 means that there is a skill factors involvement. So you have to include a skill factors for this. So the skill factor will be 10.8 divided by 0.6. So this will help you to trace what was being applied to the rest of the calculation, which is a skill factor of 18. With this information, you can now move on to calculate the final answer. The class interval for this group is 220 minus 160. And from the table that were given to us, it is about eight. So let's bring it down, put in 8, remember to multiply the 18. So with this, you will get your results as 2.4 centimeters. So this is it for question 3. So move on, we have question 4 here where this is a upper bound and lower bound question. So one decimal place, this is the things that I will always focus at. Okay, because this will help me to find the rounding value. Okay, so my rounding value is actually 0 0.1 divided by 2. Then you have to decide whether to add this rounding value or minusing off. Depends on what was being asked by the question. So they wanted the upper bound of the parameter, which means all of the sides that we involved in this calculation must be as at their highest value. So in our case, our 8.5 must be added with 0 0.05. And remember for a rectangle, there will be two sides at this length. While we have another two sides at 10.7 plus 0 0.05. So by adding them up and run the calculation, It 
it will amount at 38.6 okay so this will be your part a final answer moving on to part b they wanted the height of this parallelogram so first thing first you need to know that in a parallelogram here and here will be the same well here and here will be the same length which means our df uh, we actually have b hypotenuse length of 9 but well, we have a d over here and this is what they are looking for so with this i can now label my h here as my opposite and this is my hypotenuse so with opposite and hypotenuse we will be using sine 80 degree equals to h over 9 so h value will be 9 times sine 80 personally i would recommend you to put the sine cosine tangent at the back because if you forget to close the bracket it will affect your entire answer so for this your value will be 8.86 after correcting it to three significant figures so the next thing they wanted you to do is to explain why is cdf a isosceles triangle so for this first thing that you should notice right away is that this part here is actually 100 because straight line 100 plus 80 it will be 180 and with this information we can immediately know that this is also 40 degree because 180 minus 40 and minus 100 you get a balance of 40 okay why cdf a isosceles because angle cdf the reason is straight line okay okay you write 180 minus 80 equals to 100 and the angle DCF will be 40 because interior angle of triangle. So with this two information, you now know that angle DCF Okay, so these are the points that were labeled down for this part of the question. Calculate the area of trapezium ABCF. So these are the information that I can get. Okay, so this is what they wanted. And the other thing that I gotten was when I changed the color. This part. So for this, it is D C. So first, you will need to calculate the entire trapezium. The entire trapezium's formula will go by the base of 12 multiplied by the height that we identified, which is 8.86. Okay, and then minus off with the 
balance that we gotten, we can use half AB sine C for this triangle DCF's calculation. You get your final answer as 66.4 centimeter square. Moving on, we have question C over here. So they wanted us to calculate the area of the circle, but no radius information has been given. So at first glance, there's two rules that you need to know. First thing first is that this angle here will be angle 21. Reason being is angle from the same segment where ABD equals to angle ACD equals to 21 degree. So that's the first thing. Then the next one is that since uh, AOC is a diameter, any angle from the diameter will form a right angle. So these are the things that I will write it down. And here will be 90 degree. So with this, we should be able to calculate our radius already. Because when we trace the value, of the hypotenuse, then I divide it by 2, then I get the radius information. So let's label the things down. This is hypo and this is the adjacent. So we'll be using cosine 21 equals to 12 over hypo. So hypotenuse here will be the value of 12 divided by cosine 21 you will get your results as 12.8537399 and when this was being divided by 2 you will get the value as 6.43 as the radius the reason why I didn't round it up first because I will try to avoid any premature rounding. So the slight rounding error will cost you the marks. So to avoid that, I will round up when it's the last step. Okay. Even for this, if I didn't round up, I will write it as 6.42686 so with this information, I should be able to calculate my area by taking pi times answer square. You will get your answer as 130 after rounding it to three significant figures. Okay, this will be the answer for part C. Moving on, we have this question D over here. And the main thing that they are trying to tell you is that the parameter are equals. Okay, and for arc length, please remember, you will have to calculate the two radius. This must be included, this must be included, and this part S. Well, so there's three parts to it. So for the square, it's pretty straightforward. So I just put eight times four, and it will equals to x over 360 because it's the sector times two times pi times the radius, which is 9.5. Together with the information that we have, it should be 9.5 times two. So with all this, we have 19 pi plus 10 minus 19 
then divided by 19 pi. So your final x value will be 0.9. So remember when you key in, the pi is actually divide, uh, you can write it at the center, okay, to avoid any confusion. Then you multiply it by 360, you will get it as 78.4 for your x value. Okay, the angle over there is 78.4. Moving on, we have question 5 here. Okay, this is the graphing quadratic question. Like what I mentioned in 2020's paper, the format has been changed. So instead of using the old school way of assessing you now, the question has slightly changed and it's actually easier. So what they wanted in the first one is to trace when your y's value is 14, where would the x be located at? So let's look it up. Okay, 14 is somewhere around here. Okay, then when you bring it down, it's actually 2.75, okay? So this I will label as 2.75, all right? Moving on to part two. By drawing a suitable tangent, estimate the gradient of the function Shen graph at negative two, four. So at negative two and four. Okay, place my ruler here. Remember, when you draw the line, make sure that the gap must be somewhat similar. Okay, so this should be it. Then I'll be using this negative two, four, and alongside one of the other point that I've identified, which is the whole number over here, which is negative one, twelve. So to make it clearer for you, I'll be setting this as y2, x2, y1, x1. So the gradient goes by 12 minus four, being divided with negative 1 minus negative 2. So this will help me to get the results as 8. So I get my gradient as 8 for this particular question. So moving on to the next question. By drawing a suitable straight line, solve the information fx equals to 2x minus 2. So let's bring this thing up. This is what they gave us. fx equals to 2x minus 2. So you have to treat it as x and fx here. Okay, as usual, I will draw a table like this. Okay, so let's say when my x is 0, my fx will be negative 2. And let's say when my fx is 0, this time, will be 1. So by plotting these two things down, okay, bring out the ruler, okay, 
so this is the line that I've drawn. And the intersection here is actually located at this red line. So this thing here will actually have a value of negative 2.85, okay? For my drawing, this is the answer that I should be getting. So this is pretty much it for part number three. Then let's move on to the last question. So the diagram show this curve, okay, intersect at A and B. So find the coordinates. So what you have to do now is to base on the information. There's no use to look at the graph. Okay, uh, all you need to do is to solve this equation here. So what they're expecting will be 2x squared minus 2x minus 7 equals to 3x plus 5. So when you bring everything together, you will arrive at this point here. So for this, you have to factorize it. So you will get your answer as x minus 4 followed by 2x plus 3. So x will be coordinates of 4 or x equals to negative 3 over 2. So with these two information, you have to sub them into the y. So in our case, I'll be subbing it into this because it's easier. So when x equals to 4, y will be 3 times 4 plus 5. So this will be 17, while the other hand So this will get me 1 over 2 So the coordinates that we gotten was 4 17 followed by negative 3 over 2, 1 over 2. So let's look at the curve to identify who's your A, who's your B. So in our case, A will obviously be 4, 17, while B here will be negative 3 over 2, 1 over 2, or you can write it as negative 1.5 followed by 0 0.5. So these two will be your final A and B's coordinates. Moving on to question six, what we have here was a bearing question. There's a few things that they wanted us to do, which is to identify angle CBD. Okay, and show that it will round to 106. With all the points that we've gotten here, we can actually use cosine rule to make this calculation possible. Okay, so for cosine rule that we are using is this. So this is a habit of mine where I prefer to always transfer out the information first. Then I focus on what I wanted to calculate. So it's actually 192 squared plus 168 squared. I noticed there was one figures that I came wrongly. It should be 168. 
which this will affect my entire calculation so these are the little things you need to take note whenever you do this half calculation make sure everything you key in was correct So this is what you've gotten however they wanted us to correct one decimal place so after the rounding it will be 106 no problem so that's it for a number one moving on to part two bearing of d from b is 0, 3, 8. find the bearing of c from b Bearing of C from B. So with this, we actually calculated this part earlier, right? Okay, you take 106 minus 38, you get the result as 68. So when it's asking you about bearing, remember it always starts from the arrow. So they wanted C from B. All you need to do is to take 360 minus 68. So shoot this. You get it as 292. So that will be your final answer for part 2. Okay. Let's look at the following part. A is due east of B. Find the bearing of D from A. A is due east of B. Find the bearing of D from A. So remember, this is what they mean. First thing first, here to here is 180. Since they mentioned about due east, this is a 90. Alright, so these are the two information that I have gotten. Here is actually 90 because of the due east that they mentioned. So with that, if I take 90 minus 38, I will get this balance part as 52. So with this 52, I can now trace the value, sine 52 with the opposite value of 205 and 8 equals to sine unknown. So this unknown is what we have here, over 168 which is the opposite. So to trace the answer, you will have unknown equals to sine inverse. We have 168 multiplied with sine 52 and it was divided by 205.8. So when you key in sine inverse this results here. You will get the answer as 4D. So with this 40 degree, you will now know that Bearing of D from A is actually 180 plus 90 plus 40, which is 310. Okay, few key things you need to know is the keyword due east means uh, there will be 90 degrees involvement, and you need to utilize all your sign rule, cosine rule to get this question done. Okay, this is the typical bearing question that be, be appearing in your past year. So the next part B1, they want you to calculate the area of triangle BCD. So let's look at the shape that were given to us. BCD is this. Okay, we already got 106. We have 192, 
we have 168. So with this, just use half A, B, sign C, you will get your information as. One five five zero three point two two eight six three. After correcting to three significant figures, your final answer will be one five five zero zero. So that's it for part one. Thomas by the triangular parts B C D. The cost is thirty five thousand seven hundred fifty per hectare. Calculate the amount he pays and give your answers to the nearest hundred. So this fifteen thousand, okay, five hundred has to be divided by ten thousand first, then multiply with thirty-five thousand seven hundred fifty. We we'll get you 55,412.5. After correcting it to nearest 100, you will get 55,400 for this. Okay, so this is the final answer for part two. Okay, pretty straightforward. Everything was clear cut and the information has been given to us at the start. Moving on, we have question 7 where this is a sequence question. Okay, didn't see this for quite a while. It's good for it to be back. So for numbers of dot in part 1, it's uh, white dots here is very obvious. It's actually being squared. Okay. And for the next one, okay, the difference is kind of odd. So let me write them down so that I can run the geometric calculation on this question here. So based on the ABCs that we have calculated, fill in the blank. This seems to be the formula. So you're going to verify it before you proceed with the calculation. Then you can proceed with the 5 calculation. 1 over 2, 5. 5 minus 1. So for this, you will get your results as 10. And when it is 6, you get it as 15. So here is 10. Here is 15. So obviously for part C, uh, it's always somehow related to the previous calculation when 1 to 5 and then 5 to 7, 7, a 1 to 5, 5 to 12, 12 to 22 has no clear direction. So when I analyze the relationship between uh, the question, so total numbers of dots is actually white plus black. So 25 plus 10, you will get 35. 
36 plus 15, you will get 51. So this is the answer that you should be getting for part A. Write an expression to show the numbers of dot in N. Okay, white dot here will be N squared because when one was being squared, you get one. Two being squared, you get four. As for part C, the impression of the total numbers of dot is one over two bracket 3n squared minus n. Find the numbers of dot in the 8th diagram. So what they are telling you is that substitute 8 into the n's position. So through the calculation here, you get your answer as 92 pro C number 1. As for the expression in part 2, we already did the calculation earlier. It is 1 over 2 n bracket n minus 1. Okay, so that's the simplest form that I would write. Okay, the answer is given over here. Okay, this is your part C, number two's answer. Okay, so here comes part D. T is the total of numbers of dot used to make all of the first N diagram. T equals to A N cubed plus B N square. So when we are looking at diagram one, There's only how many dots over there? There's only one. So T equals to A1 cubed plus B1 square equals to one dot. So A plus B equals to one for that. If we were to look at the first two graph, which is diagram one plus diagram two, So we have a total number of how many dots then? So in diagram 2, there is a total of uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6 dots, regardless of their color. So 8a plus 4b equals to 6. So by running the calculation, I can use uh, simultaneous. Here, I'll be using elimination where I take 1 multiplied by 8. So I get 8a plus 8b equals to 8. Then I will be taking diagram 3. And equation 3 minus my equation 2 which is 8a plus 8b minus 8a plus 4b there equals to 8 minus 6 so this will be cancelled off remember negative multiply into everything you have a balance of 4b after the calculation and your b will be 1 over 2 so when b is 1 over 2, sub into equation 1. You will get your answer as 1 over 2 as well. So this will be your final answer for a and b. Both is amount at 1 over 2. Okay, so that's pretty much it for part D. Moving on, we have question 8. Okay, finally, some question that is relatively easy. So if you can manage the answers, uh, the question from previous part so far, 
this shouldn't be any problem so for the first one you notice a and b is repeating after you extract it out you have a balance of a b bracket 3a minus b moving on to part b okay inequalities question quite tricky here So you got negative 2x less than negative 15. So remember, when you try to get rid of negative, the inequality's direction will change. So this will be your final answer. Moving on to question C. You have to multiply the 3 into every 1. Please remember this. So 3 was being cubed. X, you will have this. And Y, you have to multiply by 3 as well. So you get your results as 27. X to the power of 6 and Y to the power of 12. As for the next one, it's just cross multiplication. You will get your answer as the following. Moving on to part E. Okay, I'll be doing them separately. First, I get this sorted out first. Okay, I arrange it further. Then only I multiply them up again. And this will be your final answer. For part F, okay, remember uh, this is a compound interest. So to make the calculation possible, this will be the workings. One hundred percent will be equals to one. R percent I remain unchanged first. Then we have to square, shift 200 away. So 206.46 divided by 200. So I further expand this. Multiply them up. Arrange everything according to plan. I bring the negative. I bring the 1.0323 over. Okay. Then the last step is to get rid of the percentage there. So since percentage is divided by 100 and it was being squared at the front, I will actually have this at the bottom. So by making their denominator the same, I should be able to prove the results the question wanted, which is 200R minus 323 as my final answer. So for part two, Whenever you saw two decimal place, please remember they are referring to quadratic equation. So they expect you to write all this thing down and then we arrange them up. So negative b plus minus b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Okay, you can actually use your calculator but you have still have to show some of the steps. Like 
is over here. So by keying into the calculator, you should know your results is uh, having two answers. One of them is negative, which obviously the negative one will not be accepted because from 200, it increased to 206, which means the rate is positive. So in our case, only one answer will be accepted, which is the 1.60. So remember to include the zero because they wanted two decimal places. If you write 1.6, your marks will be deducted. That's the answer for your R. Moving on to the last few questions that we have here. Okay, question 9a. This is a Venn diagram that they wanted us to fill up. So first thing first, do not study anything means it's outside at the 5. Study German is 15, study Spanish is 18. But they didn't tell us what is repeating. So I'll be setting an X over here. German will be 15 minus X, while Spanish will be 18 minus X. By adding everything up, it will be equals to 32. So crossing them off, you have a balance of 6. So when I fill out the graph, I write it in red. So this you don't have to write. Then for this 15 minus 6, you will get 9. 18 minus 6, you will get 12. And this 5 remain unchanged. So you just have to fill up 5, 9, 6, and 12 for the answer. So probability question for part 2. Probability that a student studies Spanish but not German. So which means out of the students over there, only 12 of them study Spanish only. So 12 over 32, let's simplify it. You will get your answer as 3 over 8. Or you can write it as 0 0.375. Moving on. We have students who studies German is chosen at random. This will immediately narrow down uh, the total amount of students. It was decreased to 15. And those among who studies German also study Spanish. So we calculated there's only six of them. So six over 15 will be your answer. Or you can write it as 0.4. Moving on to part B, a bag contains 54 red marbles and some blue marbles. 36% of the bags are red. So total times 36%, you will get 54. So total will be 54 divided by 36%, you will get 150. So from this 150, you minus of 54, and you get blue, which is 96. Okay, move on to part C. Another bag contains 15 red bits and 10 yellow bits. Pick at random, okay, records its colors, then put it back, which means the denominator will not decrease because whatever that you have picked will be put back. So two red bits at once, which is 15 over 25 times 15 over 25. So this will get you 9 over 25 as your final answer. So probability that he does not pick two red bits will be by taking 1 minus 9 over 25, which will result in 16 over 25. So the next one is quite tricky because they use the word at least. So these are the following scenario. Red is 15. Not red will be 8 plus 2 which is 10. 
So this is one category. This is one category. So I list down the possibility first. It can be red with not red. Not red with red followed by red with red. So the probability will be 15 over 25 times 10 over 24. You notice the denominator decrease because they mentioned about without replacement. So for the other one is 10 over 25 multiplied with 15 over 24. And the last part will be 15 over 25 times 14 over 24. The reason why both decreases is because both is red. So after you draw one red out, the total number of red will decrease. So the final calculation after you add everything up will be 17 over 20. So that's pretty much it for this question here. Move on to question 10. Okay, very good. Some new question from the syllabus. So calculate the point A, B and C. So for you to get A and B, it is where your Y is zero. So I will do that first. A and B is actually when Y is zero. So for this, your X squared plus three X minus four equals to zero. So one of them will be one and the other one will be negative four. So that's for your A and B's coordinate. Moving on to find C, C will be your X equals to zero. This is much easier. Okay, because zero was being squared plus three times zero minus four, your answer will be negative four right away. And the coordinates will be as shown. Next part, okay. Oh, so uh, pretty easy, just differentiate. Remember to take out the power. Okay, when they didn't write anything means it is one. When they don't have any x, means that it is x to the power of zero. So when you bring out the power, multiply with the value at the front. If they don't have anything, means it is one as well. Two times one is two, x. So remember, after you take out the power, it will be minus one at the power section. Followed by three times one, it will still be three, and then x, one minus one is zero. So you automatically cancel off. So for the integer of negative four, when it was multiplied by zero, it will cancel off entirely. So there won't be any variables over there. So that is your final answer after you differentiate it. Okay, find the equation of tangent to the curve at the point 2, 6. So for part 3, do remember that the dy dx that we identified is actually the gradient. Okay, it's called gradient function. So when we substitute 2 into the x position plus 3, we will get this as 7. Where for the equation, this 7 represents our gradient. So by substituting 6 and 2 into the position again, then you should be able to trace your C as. So the calculation should be C equals to negative 8. So the equation for this entire thing will be y equals to 7x minus 8. Okay, so that's pretty much it for part 3. And moving on, we have this graph here. So tangent graph is very straightforward. It looks like a star shape. Okay, so remember, it can never touch the 90 degree line. Yeah, we try and draw from here then. Okay, so 
the other one will be from here going downwards then continue going up again going downwards so that's how you illustrate it out and for part two they ask you to solve this okay this is actually quite great question okay so what we have here is tangent x equals to negative 7 over 5 so for tangent to be negative okay there's limited range for that all school teacher crazy so only those who is in sine and cosine will be accepted so now you can key in tangent inverse, negative 7 over 5. And you will get your results as negative 54.46 roughly. But remember, the answer, the range was in positive range. So this negative 54.46 actually doesn't uh, represent anything. Okay but you can use it to trace the actual results so this is what i always do remember start from this line to here so our x results will be 360 minus 54.46 followed by the other one which is this uh, yellow line here, uh, red line here as well but this time around it is from the black line to here only so the 54.46 will be transferred over here to make this calculation possible. I'll be taking 180 minus 54.46. So with this, the two results should be 305.54 followed by 125.46. Okay, so this two will be the final answer. So that's pretty much it for this paper 41. Okay, uh, I hope you like this new format of the video. If you got any feedback, feel free to leave it in the comment section. And you got any question to ask, you can leave there as well. I will try to clear your doubts whenever I'm available. So I wish you all the best in your upcoming examination. Thank you.